Welcome back. Well, we just heard from Bauer Media's Director of Sales with the Gourmet Traveller Hotel of the Year Awards. James Manning also spoke with Anthea Lucas, Gourmet Traveller Editor, on why sponsors and events are so important to the magazine. We've had the Travel Awards for the last seven years before the Hotel Guide, and we just felt it was really important for Gourmet Traveller to embrace or celebrate our travel, you know, the travel offer that we have. It's a really important editorial offer, a, a editorial pillar, I should say, of the magazine. Magazine. And we've done that for you know 30 odd years with the Restaurant Guide Award. So this is our way of saying, hey, travel industry, we love you. And this is our way of yeah celebrating what they do. And working with the sponsors is very critical for editors these days. Uh, Nespresso is the, the major sponsor here tonight. Um, just tell us a bit about working with them. We couldn't do what we do without Nespresso, as we like to say, you know, as reviews don't write themselves, room rates don't pay for themselves either, and quite frankly, without the support of Nespresso, this guide would not exist. Um, Espresso and Nespresso have been with us for nine years with the Travel Awards that predated the um, hotel guide, and they're just so supportive. They, you know, they're in hotels, they're big supporters of the travel industry, and like I said, we couldn't, we couldn't produce the editorial products we produce without them, so we're very thankful to have them on board and they're great friends of Gourmet Traveller. Now I guess the guide is a big incentive for people to buy the, the actual magazine. Does it have a digital life as well? Yeah, it does. It, it, it lives on our iPad edition, which is great. Um, so yeah, on both, you know, we, we like to think of Gourmet as you know multi-platform brand, and we publish on various. You know, we don't even think about whether we're publishing on digital or in print. They both exist, you know, side by side. So um, it does. Yeah, it lives both in digital format and in print. Now you, you mentioned the restaurant awards. So what what are the big what are the bigger key um, issues, if you like, of the year? So the hotel guide, the restaurant awards. Do you do anything else? Yeah. So the restaurant awards are in our September issue, with the with the awards themselves in in August, mid August. And then our other big issues would be Christmas. I mean, everyone loves to cook at Christmas, obviously. Um, our French and Italian issues are really popular. Our French issue is in October. Our Italian issue is in March. Um, and then our other big issue would be our November issue, which is all about celebrating the party season. So yeah. What's the editor? mix between food and travel how, how do you keep the balance and does it does it change much over the years yeah I would it, it does change I mean predominantly well the, the large part of the magazine is devoted to food but travel has becoming an increasingly more important um, editorial offer for us and it's just something that I think is fun and our readers really respond to 40% of our readers are male which is really interesting you know when you look at maybe perhaps some of the other food titles and I would I would venture to say that that's because of our travel offer, though a lot of men like to cook, obviously. Um, but I think, you know, travel is what sets us apart. We, we cover travel, we invest in travel coverage, I think, in a way that no other Australian publisher does. Um, we spend a lot of money making sure that we have the best writers, the best photographers, the best destinations covered in our magazine. And I think that's a really important part of the market that we continue to grow, and we are doing that incrementally every year. Is the celebrity chef phenomenon? It's been around for a while now, but is yeah. it, does it, you get some good writers with some big name bylines, but has it affected you much? Yeah, I like to think that, I like to say that, you know, food is the new fashion. I mean, I think that, you know, food has a place in popular culture now that it never has before. And when we're, um, when we're a product that's, you know, all about food and all about celebrating food that that is a great place to be in the media landscape and I definitely think that you know while let's it's fair to say that the viewer of my kitchen rules or master and chef may not be intimately um, um, familiar with gourmet traveler that maybe that that they might you know buy into that I mean let's face it no one knew what who Peter Gilmore or Snow Egg was you know but more than three years ago so I think we're really well placed to take advantage of that let's just finish with a couple of tips for our, our viewers if you like uh, the hotels what city's got the biggest um, spread of uh, best hotels in Melbourne Sydney or somewhere else oh well there's so many great hotels all over Australia I would say that the really interesting um, phenomenon that we notice in this year um, guide was that Brisbane is like booming and there's lots of new hotels there whether you're talking about Next or Trip or Gambaro or the new Inchcombe lots of great new products coming online in Brisbane um, Canberra we still love Hotel Hotel it's such a great product um, 
Um, the Langham here in Sydney is incredible and there's lots of new things happening in Melbourne and there's always, you know, Melbourne has those great establishment hotels like Crown and the Western and yeah, so, you know, check in. It's a great time to be enjoying hotels in Australia. And finally, travel hotspots. So is it the, the, the same familiar place? Is there anything new on the horizon there? Oh, look, I think um, there's, you know, there's lots, there's, it, it depends sort of what you're interested in. I think, you know, in Australia, I think Canberra and Hobart and even Adelaide are really interesting at the moment. There's lots of great food happening in, in Adelaide. Our readers love the classics like Rome, and we could never write enough about Rome and Paris, really. I mean, Southeast Asia, there's always lots of new products coming online. Um, and I think Africa is something that's just, you know, I think we're starting to acknowledge. Oh, I think, you know, Australians are great travellers, and I think they've always travelled to Africa, but I think, in a way, Africa seems to be more accessible to us now. So I think that's definitely a space to watch. Macquarie Capital has been appointed to handle the Australian Football League's $1.8 billion broadcast rights. Fairfax reporting Macquarie will work with the AFL to negotiate with several broadcasters, including 7, 9, 10 and Foxtel. It's believed the AFL has told the networks it's looking to sign a deal for $1.75 billion over a five-year period. For more on that, we're joined by Evan Lucas from IG. Evan, quite a win for Macquarie, this one. Yeah, it is, and it just goes hand in hand with the high-profile premium sort of corporate negotiations that Macquarie continues to get. I know, obviously, it is outside the media space, but it just shows you why they are becoming an absolute bright spot in the banking space with regards to where the share market's at. It's up 38% year-to-date. I think the other interesting thing around the deal is the other side, and looking at what will now happen around that deal, it would be an historic deal, not just for the AFL, but in terms of sport in general in this country, it would look at really ramping up that presence we currently hear listening to 7 West Media, listening to 9 and to 10 about getting your hands on sport and the advertisement dollars that come with that. There is already signs that mo all those three, including Foxtel as well and News Corp to some extent, are looking to cut costs around where they can to actually get ready to bid up for the AFL and those rights. So although they want 1.8, it may even turn into a really strong bidding war and could go higher still. That that, I think, is, is quite an interesting prospect because it is the one part of the media space that is still very, very lucrative and EPS accretive. Speaking of cutting costs, there's news today that Fairfax is preparing to retrench more than 100 workers at, at its New Zealand operations. What's behind that? Yeah, and, and this gets back to what we've been seeing. So uh, TVNZ looks like losing up to 100 uh, staff. There may be some new positions created, but it just goes back in line with the idea at the moment that that part of their business is not firing. They are looking to basically see where wherever they are losing money that they're going to have to cut costs and they have brought it down from double digit to seven but that means they're still losing a seven percent margin that they can't afford to do. The New Zealand business has been sort of humming and ahhing in terms of where it's at. It is certainly flatlining in terms of movement and their TV arm which is some part that you would expect actually to do quite well has been one of their underperforming parts of their whole portfolio so that's why it is there. They are still looking to cut costs and get themselves back onto a flat level flat playing field and that's why New Zealand is under the hammer right now. All right Evan Luke Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks, Ingrid. Evan from IG there. Back to our guest host today, Ian Perrin, of course, uh, from Zenith Optimedia in the studio. Ian, you know, talking about the AFL rights, um, it just brings you, I guess, to the importance of just how much sport means to, to television and the deals there, the advertisers as well. We had, the obviously, the first State of Origin clash held this week. Now, we pulled an audience of uh, 2.432 million viewers. That's on average. That's down slightly on last year, though. Last year, it was 2.4 uh, 8-7 for Game 1 audience, so it's slightly lower than last year. What do you make of that? Um, I don't think I make an awful lot of the 8%. I think it is decline yep. in audience. I think they tend to go up and down over years. Um, so I still think it's a very strong result for Channel 9. They'll be very pleased with that. Um, in terms of sports rights, it's not just the ability to aggregate audiences at scale, but it's an important play uh, for the networks in terms of promoting some of their shows for the remainder of the year. Um, uh, so I think they'll be really happy with that performance. Well, and advertisers love it, right? Uh, advertisers absolutely love it. Live um, sport. Live sport is fantastically good uh, in order to reach people very quickly. Uh, the real value is not just the people who regularly watch TV, but what you find is a lot of light TV viewers um, watch live sports, and certainly with, a, with something like State of Origin, they, they turn out in droves. And there's probably a lot of unreported audience um, who are watching. They're highly engaged in the programming. Um, because they, you know, rather than sitting on their couch and, and not being involved in the programming, 
So it's very much a lean forward type engagement. So it's, it's a great environment for many of our brands. Is sport where the value is for free air going forward, do you think? Um, I think there's probably three areas that um, free to air now focus on. The first is news, and that's probably less relevant than it used to be. Um, and the next two are reality and sport. Mm -hmm. um, so literally they're becoming two trick ponies with regards to content um, focus you know, on getting the very best reality uh, TV format. Uh, and then obviously what becomes critically important is who gets the best sports rights. Mm. Interesting you mentioned news there because uh, we'll just take a look at the ratings now for week uh, 21 for free to air kicking it off. And news actually takes the top spot. There it is, 7 News Sunday. And you've got 9 News in there as well. So they are still taking top spots. They're ratings. still doing incredibly well. Um, and I think that's the time when people aggregate around the shows. Um, but I think increasingly people are getting their news from other sources. So um, as a trend globally, we're seeing fewer people watching um, news on free-to-air uh, television. Um, and, and I'm sure that trend will happen here in Australia. Catching the light, that seven special as well, coming in second spot. And then, of course, MasterChef, which actually, if we turn the page, we'll see MasterChef takes a lot of the rest of the top ten. Uh, there you can see it takes eight, nine and ten spots. Let's take a look now at the subscription television ratings uh, for week 21. This is the top five sports. So obviously AFL and NRL at this time of the year taking those top five spots. Absolutely. I think, you know, that's what would be expected. I think on the previous page, what's probably wasn't expecting, uh, expected was the incredibly strong performance of MasterChef. Mm. Um, that's a, a show that's been around for a long time. Uh, Ten have been able to revitalise it. Uh, and that's a fantastic uh, result for Channel 10. All right, moving on and taking a look at the top five non spot on subscription television game of thrones no surprises there to take the top spot also got the real housewives in there and wentworth as well just returning to ian perrin as well from uh, one more question on basically sbs because we've been hearing a lot about eurovision it's had a lot of publicity in the last uh, couple of weeks in particular drew some big audiences for sbs do you have many clients who use sbs um, at the moment and do you have any thoughts on whether they should be able to move some of their daytime ad minutes into prime time uh, well, first off, I must say that uh, SBS are one of our clients, so I must declare that. Um, I think that, you know, before they were a client, we used to use them a fair deal. Uh, I mentioned earlier about the importance of reaching very light TV viewers, uh, and SBS does an excellent job of that. Um, it also gives us the opportunity to profile very specific audiences, um, so it's very helpful uh, from that point of view. Uh, with regards to moving more of their ad dollars or their ad opportunities into prime time, I think that's a really good thing for advertising. I think it's good um, for them. Uh, so I, I'm, I'm all for that. All right, Ian, we'll have to leave it there. But a big thank you to our guest host today, Ian Perrin, Chief Executive of Zenith Optimedia in the studio with us. And that is all we have time for on this edition of Media Week. Thanks for joining us.